Welcome to the Enterprise Excellence Podcast, where our purpose is to help create a better future. Learn from our world's experts how to improve your organization sustainably. Learn how to achieve and sustain an excellence journey for yourself, others, and the planet. And I'm your host, Brad Jevons, coming to you from Brisbane, Australia. We are proudly brought to you in association with SA Partners, a world-leading business transformation consultancy. SA Partners are a truly purposeful company focused on helping organisations achieve sustainable improvement for themselves, others, and the planet. Welcome to episode 60 of the Enterprise Excellence Podcast. It is such a pleasure to have Mr. Mike Jose on the show with us today. Mike is the co-author of Toyota Culture with Jeff, Dr. Jeff Leiker. Mike has dedicated his career to helping organisations create cultures of continuous improvement, creating systems of willing and able problem solvers at all levels of the organisation. Let's get into the episode. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Fantastic. Thank you for having me, Brian, and uh, thank you, audience, for joining. Yeah, appreciate it, Mike. Mike, what's what's your backstory, Mike? Like, what got you involved in this field of, you know, creating cultures and continuous improvement, problem solvers at all levels? My backstory goes back a few years here. I'm getting gray, but, um, you know, I, I, I got onto it by happenstance, really. I So I'll tell the story quickly, but it is, a, I think, an interesting one. I worked for Toys R Us. Um, selling toys, <laughs> managing a toy store out of college. My wife was transferred, she was actually my fiance at the time, was transferred to Lexington, Kentucky, uh, managing a residence in. And the Japanese who were starting up the new Toyota plant in Georgetown, Kentucky, were staying at her residence in. And uh, they said, hey, have your uh, fiance put in his application, meaning me. And I, she came, told me that one weekend back up in Cincinnati. I'm like, that's a dumb idea. You know, I don't know anything about cars and nothing about manufacturing. I don't even think I've ever been in a plant. So, uh, you know, skip that. But she comes back the next week and she says, hey, I told them what you told me. And they said, you're exactly the type of person they're looking for. And I said, what? <laughs> you know, they're looking for somebody who knows nothing about cars, nothing about manufacturing. Yeah, that's what they said. And I said, well, I can do that. So I'll give it a shot. <laughs> so, uh, so I went through, um, at the time, they had uh, three days of assessments and testing. We can maybe talk a little bit about that. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to, to pass that assessment and was the 201st person hired in the first fully owned Toyota plant in anywhere in North America. And I was a supervisor group leader, if you recall. They sent 400 Japanese trainers to teach us the Toyota production system to teach us the Toyota way. Only one of them held a position in the plant. That was the president. All the rest of them were our trainers, our shadows. And, and every group leader and above had a shadow. And, and so I was a group leader, so I had one. Um, and so as a group leader, I'm on the assembly line, you know, working for uh, 20 team members, operators, uh, call them team members and four team leaders. And we had good success. So I uh, was promoted, uh, to assistant manager after a couple of years, we added a second shift and I was promoted to uh, assistant manager over the three chassis lines working for about 200 people. And now I had another Japanese trainer teach me that role. Uh, then they announced a second plant for Toyota in North America. Then they came back and said, well, it's gonna be right next door to the existing plant in Kentucky. And the, the plant in Kentucky is the largest Toyota plant anywhere in the world because it's basically two plants put together. And so I was promoted to plant manager of assembly number one, uh, working for about a thousand people. And now I had a plant manager from Japan teaching me how to be a plant manager uh, in the Toyota production system. A couple of years later, I was promoted to general manager level, which is executive level. I had both assembly plants working for 2000 people. Now I had an executive coach teaching me the role of the executive uh, in the system. So very, very grateful, very, very fortunate to have, um, again, firsthand Japanese training from a supervisor level, manager level, and executive level. Um, now, from there, Toyota does, uh, you know, who does HR development, leadership development, and part of the strategy is to rotate people, whether you're an operator or a supervisor, man, rotate horizontally as well as growing vertically. And so it's my turn to be rotated. So uh, they rotated into human resources. I don't have time for that story, but actually that was, that was um, against my will. <laughs> I didn't want to go to HR and make them know that would be good for you and the company. And I was glad I got there. I was glad I did it, or they did it to me after I got there, because uh, I learned about what I call the people systems. 
you know, I learned the production systems and uh, obviously in production, uh, it was like a fish in water. I didn't know how the water got there until I got to HR. Uh, and it was very systematic, very intentional, uh, very powerful. And um, so that's, that's where I kind of got the, uh, this people <laughs> systems idea, you know, not idea, because again, I didn't come up with it, but kind of the revelation, right? Because uh, now that was, you know, we were 13 years into it at that point in time in, in uh, Toyota's history in North America. And people were grabbing Toyota leaders to, you know, come work for them and to be lead consultants or whatever. And they were taking the production system and the, the tools and the process, but they missed the people side. They missed the system. And so, you know, they had some quick, uh, you know, low-hanging fruit or whatever, or quick successes, but not a sustainable uh, culture. Mm. And, and that's what I learned in the HR side is that it takes both of those systems put together to create this culture uh, that's going to sustain and keep and keep improving. So that's a quick, I hope quick, quick enough backstory of uh, of how I got um, my experience at Toyota. Now I left the company, do some mission work, and that uh, that Toyota supported me on that. Uh, they had an HR problem they wanted to, to work on. So when I came back to the Kentucky after a couple of years away, um, their hiring system was rejecting 96 out of 100 people. Wow. 96 out of 100 people, whether it was a high school graduate, a college graduate, or coming from the workforce. And they were failing in the same two categories, which were the two core competencies of, of the Toyota way. Of uh, problem solving and teamwork. Mm. And so, Toyota, so we need to um, solve that problem. And so, I, they subcontracted me and I got a team together. And so, we put together training for schools and for high school kids on how to grow in problem solving and teamwork. So, that was in 1999 and we're still going. Uh, so, but throughout that process, I met Dr. Jeffrey Liker, who was the Toyota Way, of course. And I told him but basically the same story. And he said, oh, my goodness, we need to write a book about that. We need yeah. to write a book about that people side, right? And um, I said, there are plenty of books out there on the, on the technical side. So we, we wrote Toyota Culture. And I'm very thankful to Dr. Like, because I, I told him at the time, like, I don't know anything about writing a book. <laughs> I'm a production guy. He said, uh, you give me the stories, information, I'll, uh, I'll, and he did. I mean, he wove it together beautifully, added his stuff. And uh, so we got, a, I think, a real a, a helpful book. I've been told that anyway. And uh, and that book also has given me opportunity to travel around the world and meet lots of industries, lots of organizations, because this leadership, people, culture topic spans any organization, right? Which I believe Lean does as well, the technical side, but sometimes people have a little more trouble seeing how that fits, but everybody sees how the culture, people side fits. And uh, so that's what I've that's what I've been doing. So I get it. I appreciate having a chance to, to talk to your audience. Yeah, Mike, that's that's amazing. And Mike, I heard through that tale too, you know, the breadth of experience you got, you know, going from the right at the front line of the plant all the way through the leadership levels, experiencing that really high level coaching. You know, you were you were helped the whole way through. But then also yes. being able to immerse yourself in the culture side of Toyota through the HR side right, and then take it right. further where you're looking at culture and school children coming through <laughs> the local schools. Like yeah. that's, that's an amazing system of Toyota, but it's also an amazing journey that you have to get such a breadth of knowledge. Yeah. And you, you hit the key there with, you know, that's, that's the Toyota thinking the long-term mutual prosperity, long-term thinking, of, Hey, let's solve this problem back, you know, with school kids. And so that, that is cool because because sometimes, you know, because we had, the, you know, the Japanese set up these standards for our hiring system, you know, that you had to demonstrate so much competency in problem solving teamwork. And we had trouble hiring, like I mentioned, you know, and so the, you know, early on the Americans, you know, wanted, well, let's, let's open the window, right? Let's, let's, let's loosen the standards. And, and the, of course, the Japanese were like, no, no good. That's not the way we do things, you know? And uh, so they said, you know, so work on the pipeline, you know, not opening the standard the window so uh so that is that shows its way of thinking both from a, a standard point of view quality and from a long-term thinking 
Yeah, they obviously obviously practiced what they preach with that and got to the root cause and went right. How do we, how do we, <laughs> yeah, how do we fix that right co- root cause? Okay, let's call Mike. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's that's been good. Yeah, yeah, especially when you've got that targeted market, don't you, around Kentucky? Like, you know, you you're running this plant and you can skill up the kids in that local area. It's amazing, especially on techniques like root cause, and they they, they will help the children and the kids no matter where they go. And, and, and it's all right. We call it life skills, you know? Yep. So you're right. And whether it's the communication and, and teamwork and or the problem solving, both are going to help them wherever they go. Yeah. Whatever they do. Sure. Hey, Mike, Mike, who are some people that really inspired you through that journey? Are there one or two that really stand out? Oh my goodness. It, it was those, it was those Japanese coaches, like you mentioned. Um, now let me clarify because this is a misnomer a lot of times in my teaching and stuff. It's like, well, no wonder Toyota does so well. They got all these Japanese. It's like, well, no, no, the Japanese aren't there anymore. You know, so it was a, it was a, a, a train the trainer, a coach the coach system, right? So they started with 400, you know, then after three, five years, it was probably 200. And then there was one for every assistant manager and above. Now, my, now again, fortunately in my journey, I was then assistant manager. So I still had one for me and my 200 people instead of one for every 20, but that makes sense. Uh, a couple of years later, you know, they make it a hundred, one for every manager. And above. Well, now I'm a manager. So I still have one for me and my thousand people, but he's, he's my coach. Right. And so, so I was fortunate, but my, the point was, is it was a, re- a reducing thing while our skills were coming up because the Toyota system, again, from the people culture is it's leader as coach, leader as coach. So so from the team member operator, it's everybody's a problem solver. From the leader, it's leader as coach. And so those two simple phrases are simple but not easy. Uh, yeah. But, but that, those are critical components. So, so those Japanese coaches who were coaching me to coach uh, were, were fantastic. And, and so they, I mean, there's no doubt I owe everything to them as far as my understanding. And, you know, I, I, was, I was telling you earlier, I, you know, I was at a conference yesterday and telling some of the old stories. And, um, and they would used to say, Mike's son, no good. And, um, and it's back to that standard that we talked about there earlier with the hiring system. So there was, you know, so it's big on, on problem solving, plan, do, check, act, setting the standard, right? So no standard, no problem. And that goes for the car, that goes for the equipment, that goes for people's behavior. So that's where I really work with folks and organizations on culture. So if we can define, hey, what should be happening, what's the standard way to behave here? Then I can coach your behaviors if they're okay or no good, because same thing if we had a color match on a bumper in a car or whatever, we have the samples and it's okay or no good. So if you're behaving as a member or a supervisor or a manager, I've got a set of behaviors and I can compare to you saying okay or no good. So I, so I tell them, the ones I remember, right, are the ones was no good, my son, right, it was my, my thinking or my behavior was not according to the standards. And, um, you know, I got Art Nimi. So Art Nimi was one that, I, that, that, to answer your specific question, he was the original um, assembly coordinator. Uh, so he was actually, you know, a, a, the man, a, the, he was training the plant manager at the time. And I was a group leader when I first met him. And um, so he, he comes to the one story on him. I, and this was after two years of working problem solving, working with team members, and we had huddle daily huddles twice a day, you know, quality circles with the operators, suggestion system. So when we, of course, we had our charts on the wall measuring safety, quality, productivity, and cost, and human resources. So, so we spent two years working on this, and we finally get them green. Right? I mean, literally, we had zero defects, zero injuries coming out of my group. Again, 20, 25 people. Uh, Downtime, et cetera. So anyway, so Art comes down in my line and he says, Mike, son, I see your line is running well. I'm like, okay, great. And, um, and he says, now what will you do? And so I'm thinking to myself, what do you mean now what will I do? Now I'm resting is what I'm doing. <laughs> I didn't say that out. <laughs> but, so he says, what? He says, Mike, son, you're all green. You have no problems. That's a big problem. Mm-hmm. What will you do? I'll maintain it. I'll sustain it. It's like, no, no. So he, so he kept asking questions. That's what they do, right? Coaching questions. And finally got me to understand I, need, I needed to 
work with my team to to reduce to find 60 seconds worth of waste to and I asked this question yesterday, what do we do with that 60 seconds? And the one lady said, well, build an extra car. I will know that if there's the demand's not any higher, we're not going to overproduce. We're going to produce a process, right? We're going to free up a person. And I asked them, what will you do with that person? And the one person, you know, one guy says, let them go. And that's no good. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the Toyota way. All right. You know, I've, I've heard bad jokes on, you know, lean means less employees are needed or something, you know. And so, so Toyota was about the respect, right? Remember the CI and the respect is the Toyota way. So, um, so no, that person gets redeployed, hopefully it gets a new opportunity, promotion, whatever. Uh, so we go down to 19. So then I ask them, you know, so what, now, how do you think my green charts are looking after I change? We have to change 20 jobs, 19. We have to train everybody on four new jobs. And when it starts getting yellow and red. Right? Yeah. So life is good again. We've got problems. And uh, so that was like my thinking was like, I can't understand this. I was, you know, I thought my job was to make these charts green, stabilize my group. And I'd be done. You know, I could coast for a while. And. And Art Nimi says to me, Mike, son, your job here, and he holds up his bicep, your job here is to make an army of problem solvers. Your team member, team member must be strong problem solvers. That's your job. And so yeah, that's what I took that to heart. So that was it made a big impact on me. Again, I was about two years into it. Now, Art Nimi, when we had that conversation, we were 1,500 people, all first shift in Kentucky. Uh, he came back, you know, they could say five years with the Patriot, Patriot and all that. So he comes back 15 years later, 20, I don't know. And there's 40,000 Toyota team members in North America. He's president of North America. Mm-hmm. And so, so he's got obviously a larger vision for, for what this is about. And again, he gave me a glimpse of that. It's like, if, you know, the, the, the secret formula I tell people if there is one, you know, is, is developing your people, coaching and developing your people, because he knew that, hey, we're going to go from 1,500 to 40,000. We need to coach and develop. That's why he wanted us to work on that Kaizen's. Sure, we got a 5% productivity improvement, but that wasn't what he was going after. He was going after building this army of problem solvers. Mm. And uh, so that 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 makes a big, made a big gang back on. So that's that's one example, but there are several examples from those. So. Mike, I, I love that. I love that, mate. So what you're saying, there's two key things is no problems, no good, Mike's son, which is <laughs> right. really one if, if everything's green, it's what's that new aspirational target that we're going for to create problems again right. to keep flexing right. the muscle. There's yeah. another element you mentioned too, Mike, which really resonated with me, which was okay, the, the the employee, it's about creating pro- everyone as problem solvers. And then if everything is green, let's set the new aspirational target and flex that, flex that muscle again. But then yeah, you mentioned yeah. something that was really struck home to me is that the leader's job is to coach. But to be able to coach, you need a standard, a behavioral standard that you can coach to. Otherwise, you're telling people how to suck eggs in a way, aren't you? <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but Mike, what? <laughs> What does that behavioral standard look like? Have you seen some good ones? Can you describe it? Because I think, I mean, a lot of companies where they struggle with that, they're like, Brad, a behavioral standard or Brad behaviors, like what on earth are you talking about? You know, everyone's just used to seeing values on the wall. We got our values on the wall, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. So great question. And that's exactly, you know, that everybody's seen the Toyota way, not everybody, but most people have seen the Toyota way house or whatever, right? Not the Toyota production system house. Now, we don't want to forget that one uh, because that, that helps on the technical side and the problem solving because it's important to have a standard on that side as well. So usually I say on the, you know, this true north, we need a standard on how we are to operate and how we are to behave. So we're kind of like operating with this operating system, like literally, and then the behaviors. And then the behavior, the problem solving kind of overlaps the two because the operating system is designed, right, to expose problems, uh, designed to, uh, you know, again, expose waste to show abnormality so that we can then do the problem solving. So the problem solving is really what brings those two together. And so there's a standard on that as well, to your point, because, you know, much of the coaching at Toyota and they had, you know, and they had a big on the job development. OJD was, again, us 
teaching the problem solving to people. So that really was a, a whole core part. Now wrapped around that is the respect and trust side. And then so to your point, we have to take those posters on the wall and bring them to life. And that's an exercise that, that you need to do for your company. That's what they had us do with the Toyota Way. We had the, the poster or whatever, right? The house. And then we were meant to then take it and say, okay, what does this mean to us? And so as a group leader, what kind of behaviors what were we talking about? And they're, they're literally everybody agreed to the standard, almost like we're doing the standard work, right? Because the standard work doesn't come down from the engineer at Toyota. You know, the op, the uh, technical sheet comes down. I don't, I'm getting too deep, I think, but, you know, they're because when I ask for standard work in organizations, they usually hand me a technical instruction sheet or an engineering instruction sheet. And, um, and we had those at Toyota, but we had the operator standard work. So that was the operators developing the standard, right? Yeah. Because yeah. they're the experts. And then people, I'll ask, why do we want that? And people say, well, so you can get their buy-in. It's like, no, you do that because they know the job the best. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, we'll get their buy-in. <laughs> but you don't do it to get their buy-in. You do it because they know best. And uh, so anyway, so I thought that was kind of interesting. And, I, you know, that so the Toyota way, it's like, hey, we're making the standard too. It's not like here it's a top-down boom. It's, hey, no, develop your behavioral standards based on these principles and value, right? And that's what we did at the plant. Yeah. Uh, and, and made it clear. Would that look like a list of behaviors that correlate back to that, um, the Toyota way, the culture, the respect and trust, Mike? Would it be like- the exercise we had. Yeah, that was what we did, you know, and, and you know, whether it was listening or, I remember the one I'd tell people, you know, I'm, Somebody's uh, working on uh, working calls me over and says, oh, "I got a problem." You know, I'm just newly promoted and wanting to show my my uh, worth or whatever. So I jump in, I solve the problem, right? And and the you know the trainer says, "No, you know, I'm happy." The person's happy. Our trainer says, "No good, Mike." <laughs> like, why no good? So because you didn't teach. You gave a fish. You didn't teach the fish. Our behavioral standard is teaching, not solving the problem for them. And so it's those types of things that, you know, because when you get down to that level, you, you need to be clear, right? Because I'm thinking I'm being respectful, helping them with their problem. Yeah. But not by the Toyota way definition. Yeah. I'm being respectful. They're saying that's disrespect. You're telling that person that they're either not worth the time or they're not able yeah. to, to learn. So which one was it? I didn't tell them that. I didn't. <laughs> yeah, that's neat. Go to enterpriseexcellencepodcast.com backslash downloads to download a diagram Michael helped me form, which outlines the link between an organization's behavioral and operating systems, root cause problem solving, innovation, and improvement. Please like, subscribe, and share this podcast to help others gain insights and create a better future. Let's get back into the episode. I love it, Mike, and I love the, I love the picture you've painted in my mind here with this too, because like... In a way, it's no standard, no good, because how can you coach if there's not a standard to coach to? Just like in football and cricket or, you know, whatever, there's a standard and there's what there's a playbook. But I love that yeah. there's a standard for culture. There's a, I don't know, I don't know, and right. please correct me if I'm using wrong language. People might know it as a team charter or a team guide or something that defines the behaviours of the team that would mean they're living their, their values. And then yeah. on the other side, you've got the operating system, which is this is a system of our excellent system for our organization. And, and this is all those systematic elements that run and then connecting it is root cause analysis, which Mike, I'm guessing whenever anything goes wrong on either side of those things, or no, not wrong. Whenever anything is showing up as a impediment or a challenge, we do root cause. Is that correct? That's correct. And, um, and, and that's a that's a really a great question and insightful. And and that's what I you know I work <laughs> hard on classes and workshops to get people to understand that. It's like this problem solving is not just on the technical, like obviously it's on that one. It's also on this culture people side. So that, that's a beautiful thing. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mike, I I listen to a lot of your talks and you know, I've been a big fan for a long time of the knowledge that you've shared. And I remember one talk you did with Peter Hines on the Enterprise Excellence Network and you're talking about no standard, no problem. You know, I right. think it was another one you're referring to another one of your coaches where they said, Mike, if yeah, there's exactly. no standard, no problem. Mike, do you mind exploring that a little bit for our listeners? 
Because yeah. when you're talking to me about those two standards and the root cause, it just rings bells for me because I've listened and read so much of your work before. But it might be interesting for our listeners to know that's the tale you tell around that no standard, no good type piece to really connect yeah. together. Yeah, I like your no standard, no problem. Um, that That's really the, the key learning. So, you know, and again, I've learned from those Japanese coaches and, you know, whether I had a problem, you know, I remember the one guy saying, <laughs> He says, you know, like, I think I thought him up, like, I got all kinds of problems. He's like, Mike's son, you know, he started asking me about him. Like, he said, you don't have problem. You have phenomenon. I'm like, what the heck do you mean? I have phenomenon. You know, that's <laughs> what kind of translation is that? You know, we, would not, we would not use that term, you know, but um, and he's like, phenomenon is when there, you have issues, but it's not a problem. And then. And then I started seeing like the human talks. I'm actually right. Like I got this issue with this team member, this issue with this operator, this issue with this equipment, this issue with the supplier, customer, you know, on and on, part, piece, and supplier. And it's like, so what we were taught is when we have those issues or those phenomenon, because again, and I know your listeners have lots of phenomenon as well. <laughs> I've, been in, I have been in manufacturing and uh, or any organization for that matter. Uh, the first question we were taught to ask is, what's our standard? Now, now they soften that because sometimes people were uh, defensive on that or whatever. So another way they would ask, and I love, is what should be happening here? Mm. What should be happening? And, um, and over 50% of the time, the answer you'll get is, I, I don't have a clue, right? Do yeah. I have one? I don't know. We do it like this. They do it like this, whatever. So, so that's when they would say, no standard, no problem. And then what do we do next? Now, sometimes people say, well, ask why. It's like, no, that's exactly what we would do. And they would say, no good. Because it's like, why, why is a problem solving root cause? That's this question. You know, that and you don't even have a problem. So why are you asking why? You should be talking about what should the standard be. Yeah. Agree on a standard and then come back and check current to identify your gap. Now you can work your cause analysis. So, so that was the thinking. Yeah. And simple, but not easy. But taking it back to the culture, I just thought of one day. I was actually in Australia doing a talk. And I remember, you know, at break or lunch or whatever, somebody, a, a group runs up to me in the hallway and says, this is great. We love this stuff on culture and leadership, but we're so, we're sitting here loving it, but we're at the same time, we're frustrated and discouraged. We got a guy back home. He, he doesn't agree with lean. He wouldn't even come to this workshop. You know, what should we do with him? And uh, I'm like, uh, I was not trying to be you know, a smart aleck. I'm like, is that a problem? And they're like, yes, it's a problem. It's a, you know, he's one of the fifth of our team, 20% of our leadership team, and we can't go anywhere with that. And he's a big barrier. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I, I'm sure it's an issue, <laughs> right? What I was asking is that, does your organization have a standard on how leaders are to behave? Oh, no, you're right. We don't. And all we do is argue with each other about his way and our way. And we just, so we get nowhere because we just argue about each other's opinions. Oh, I would recommend you go back and have some discussion on what should be happening. How should leaders be behaved? So that's the, again, simple, but not easy. So please don't mistake or you listeners that, that <laughs> I'm trying to make it sound simple because that's how the Japanese taught us. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's easy. I could imagine. Oh, sorry, Mike. Mike, I could imagine. Like, I'm visualizing. Um, you know, I'm visualizing a leadership team where we've got we've defined our behaviors against our values or what how we want to behave, and we got that. And I can then see that it comes down to what do we do when the standards not followed? Exactly, uh, and that's that's a beautiful. That's a great question. So. And that's, that's, again, whether you're on the, the technical side of the production system or the other side. I mean, I tell people my 5S story about a garbage can and taping that off and all that. You know, and again, for them, teaching plan, do, check, act. It's just stupid and silly that I was talking, and waste of time I thought of taping off a garbage can and writing garbage can. Yeah. I, I came to learn that it was actually teaching plan, do, check, act. It was teaching, make a standard, and then if there's a gap, correct it, right? And so... The hard part was keeping the garbage can in the in the square, right? Mm. So the same way on the behaviors. But then I found the power of the standard. So 
So Brad, you're not following it, right? And so now I can sit down with you and say, we've got a, we've got a problem. And here's the standard and here's the feed, here's my observation, here's the feedback from your team, here's the feedback from the survey, whatever. We've got a problem. Your, your behaviors are no good to the standards. They have to be addressed because you know going not addressing them is not a not a not an option either. So, do you want my help in addressing it? Do you want to close that gap? Do you want to mm -hmm. follow the standards? And I have had some people say no. I yep. really have. Um, not many, but there are some. That's, I remember Jeffrey Liker, I think, interviewed the one guy up in Michigan, a, a big three person or something. And I, I remember the quote went something like. You know, they've trained me to be an attack dog, and now they're bringing in this kennel club, and I'm not, it doesn't jive. I'm not, I'm not joining the kennel club. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, great. Because uh, that's easy. The, the harder ones are ones like say, yeah, okay, I want to change, and then they don't, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But, but we'll work with them. We'll work with them and give the benefit of the doubt. Uh, you know, and I've and I've got people coming to mind now. We'll work as long as you're working with me. I'll work with you to close that gap. Yeah. And and, and 80, 90 percent of the people will get the gap closed. Uh, maybe one out of ten will go off in the beginning of the process. Uh, maybe one out of ten will go off somewhere during the process. Or even at the end, we've also if, if you're really, really are respectful and trusting and you know and all that, showing the values. We'll find another place for you in the plant or the organization where you don't have to coach people or something. Right? Yeah. For those things. Uh, and that that's happened before as well. So, so the, and that's part of that respect side, right? So yeah. just the way there's a, there's a gap. So there's not an option. There's not an option not to address that gap because that would be disrespectful in Toyota definition, right? Mm. If I'm letting you go with no good behaviors, I'm not just disrespecting the rest of the team. I'm disrespecting you. Yeah. So it's yeah. respectful to, to, to close the gap. Oh, and Mark, how often do you see that, especially with behavioral? You know, if you've got a team of people and there's one behavioral problem and the root cause is not found and then they're not helped, the whole team feels totally disrespected. They're like, oh, there's, yeah. there's two standards here. That person's able to do that and, yeah. and we're here doing this. And, you know, it really destroys the culture, doesn't it? It does. And, and unfortunately, you see it all too often. So yeah, so we gotta we gotta work on that one. We can improve yeah. on that. Yeah. Mike, I love this image you paint in my mind of an organization having its operating system for excellence, having its behavioral system, which is you, you've said something very key. I see that, you know, there's a guiding light of it at the top, but then it's created at the different levels or at the front line. They're they're default, you know, it's it's cascaded, it's a, it's evolved, yeah. it's adjusted to tailor to the teams. And right. then there's root cause that sits between it which is powerful. Mike, what do you find most stops organizations heading down a path of this? Like, what do you, what do you feel is the barriers that stops organizations looking at this, working on this, throwing the energy at it to make their life better and others better? Yeah, that's uh, unfortunately, I don't, <laughs> that question doesn't excite me as much because <laughs> but it's, it's real <laughs> and there's unfortunately lots of barriers. Oh man, uh, I can sum up probably a, a, a few on the list with leadership, with leadership. So if, if we don't have top leadership on board, you know, the culture is not going to change. We'll, we'll play around with the tools. We'll play around with you know, again, some of those processes, but there's no culture change. Uh, there's no sustaining culture change with, without the leaders. Mm. And, and that's a big barrier. A lot of the leaders, they don't see that as their role. Um, you know, they'll hire a lean team and say, you know, I'm supporting lean because I hired ever many people. And it's like, we're great. We're glad you hired the people. But again, that's just that misunderstanding, again, which is a barrier. Because, the, you know, whose role is it to do lean? Not the lean team. The lean team should be coaching and teaching everybody, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so if you want to use that lean team as the coaches, like our Japanese coaches, great. But we have to agree on what's the end game, right? The end game is everybody is a problem solver, including the executives. <laughs> yeah. And that's a barrier lots of times. 
uh, you know, short term thinking, you know, lean is cost cutting. And, and I was, and that's just, again, get, getting it bass backwards or whatever, right? So it's, you know, the, the cost cutting is going to come as a result of doing the things we're talking about. Yeah. Cost, is, cost will be reduced. Um, if we go in there with cost reduction as the game plan, then there's going to be disrespectful stuff. Yeah. So, so that's a barrier. Uh, you know, again, people playing in that, that technical space and not opening it up to the leadership and the people space is a big barrier. Uh, you know, HR, I, I, you know, it, it played out my story that I've, I've said dozens of times in my, my workshops. It's like, I'll go to a workshop with a couple hundred people and I'll ask, you know, how many from HR in here? I did it yesterday. There's only 175. And I usually say there's a lady in the back who raises her hand, and there was a lady in the very back row yesterday who raised her hand. <laughs> so goes, I said, Thank you for coming. Um, you know, one HR person out of 175 people. Yeah. That's a barrier. Yeah. And when I ask, when I either I ask the operations people or I ask the HR people, like, you know, where are you? <laughs> And they're like, what's HR got to do with lean? And so that tells me they're on the technical Kanban bio stream map, all which is good. I say it's 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 not incorrect, but it's incomplete. Yeah. And so big barrier. It'd be I know um, Peter Hines is doing a lot of work at the moment on that with Cheryl Jaquil trying to do more work on connecting HR into the lean side too. Yeah. I think yeah. that'll that'll help. Hopefully, they're doing all sorts of things. It's, yeah, I liked how you said it, connecting HR to lean, not putting lean in HR. That's another barrier. Okay, well, we're putting lean up into HR. I'm like, oh, that's great. But, but I'm not talking about how to, you know, lean out your no. process. I'm talking no. about what's HR's role with that. I know, especially, Mike, when you, when you and I are talking about a behavioral system, you know, we need a behavioral system. <laughs> That's that's connecting HR in, you know. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I know they can get so caught in that. I've I've seen a lot of HR teams where they're in a environment where the company's not running well. They don't have their operating standard. They don't have their behavioural standard. They're not doing root cause, yeah. and HR is just bogged down with industrial relations situations. You know, they're just yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, firefighting. Leaving like it we away. are over. <laughs> But let me, let me remember, you just reminded me, and I meant to say it when you asked about, you know, the uh, what do you do when someone's not following the behavior standard? And we said address it. Uh, but really what we got to do is prevent it. Um, so, so that's where the HR systems come in. And that, this is where I talked about it in the book. Like, this is, this is so key. And this was my aha when I went up to HR. Like, this is how you do it. So by making those behavioral standards and those competencies, now we integrate those into the HR system. So that's how we hire people. So if you're not able to demonstrate those behaviors or, you know, demonstrate them and have your past employers verify that you demonstrate those, you're not getting hired. Mm. That's how we get the four out of a hundred. Right. And, uh, and then if, and you're not going to get promoted. So, so the team leader promotion system, group leader promotion system is checking your ability to demonstrate those behaviors, both from the problem solving root cause and the people the coaching respect. I'm going to again, evaluate you and coach you. I'm sorry, evaluate and coach and compensate and reward all based on those behavioral standards mm. and technical standards. So, so when we can work that system, now we're getting a sustainable culture, right? Now I can, I can lead. And I, the culture doesn't leave with me because the system's built. Yeah, that's neat. It's neat. I loved how you added in there too, Mike, the um, behavioral and the competence standard because, you know, being clear, I, you, you do meet a lot of organizations where they don't have a competence standard and they don't have a proper onboarding approach and a development approach and a cross-training approach and all those. So it's very, yeah, that's the other part of that human standard, isn't it? It's that yeah, behavioral and system. competence. Yeah, that's neat. Yeah, yeah. Mike, our conversations really stood out from any other conversations I've had. Just that that simple picture you've painted in my mind of those two circles and the connecting, two areas and the connecting with root cause. But Mike, what would be a two-minute tip you would give to someone, a leader, one of these busy leaders or busy employees on what to focus on first when you're looking to take 
a journey down this path, what would be that two minute tip you would give them? Yeah, it's kind of summarizing what we've talked about, you know, having, having a problem solving standard. I asked that yesterday and probably not, not even half the hand went up in that group of 175 ones said, how many of your companies had a problem solving standard? So how are we going to coach problem solving? <laughs> to your point earlier, we're not having a problem solving standard. So let's make a problem solving standard and then let's, co and then let's coach it. Mm -hmm. um, I, think I got some uh, minute left. So then <laughs> so we're going to, so now what Toyota does there is puts together what they call the FMDS or floor management development system. So we got our problem solving standard. Now throughout the day, we're going to have huddles. We're going to have our scoreboard and we're going to identify gaps, right? From their goal to actual. And now we're going to identify problems. We're going to prioritize them and we're going to assign them to people so we can start practicing the kata. Like Mike Robin talk, practicing the problem solving. Mm -hmm. And, and we can do that at every layer. Everybody in the organization should be standing in front of a scoreboard once a day, or now we can do it virtually with Zoom, whatever, and, and identifying and working on a problem. I had another Japanese story where the guy ends and says, solve one problem today, Mike. said, so I'm running around firefighting. He says, well, I know you got lots of fires, but while you're writing the fires, solve one problem. Uh -huh. Pick one and solve one. So if we can get... My thousand people in assembly doing the same thing. Now I'm making progress. Yeah, that's neat, Mike. Thank you so much. And Mike, for yourself, what's been something you've learned recently that you didn't know before? Like, what's been a recent insight for you? Uh, well, this technology has been uh, insightful, and um, you know the whole Zoom thing. Because even before COVID, you know, I was getting questions on you know, so on the scoreboards and things, you know, so what's electronic, what's paper, and and I always, you know. And some, some old school people say like, well, the Japanese only wanted paper and stuff. And it's like, no, the Japanese wanted problem solving. Yes. That's the behavior. So if, if having your secretary do the charts doesn't result in that, then that's no good. You know, if, if having a, it in the computer doesn't result in that, then that's no good. It wasn't the secretary or the computer that's no good. It's the re no resulting problem solving it's no good yeah so so let's adjust the system so now if we can use this technology and zoom has opened up a new world right and, and miro and mural and all the different oh, ones, yeah. you know so we can so and and i was just at a company two weeks ago and they were like our people aren't coming back you know there's a percentage of them that aren't coming back and so we got to figure out how to connect this technology to the face-to-face -face, power of the face-to-face -face. because the power of the face-to-face -face was the teamwork was the you know the accountability, the ownership, and all that? It's like okay, how are we going to get that with the technology mm. and face to face this hybrid model? Uh, so that's what I, so that's what I enjoy learning because it's it's all new territory, right? Yeah, it's been a it's been amazing, and I've I've had so many insights here for myself on that, Mike. Like I'm I'm a fan of I won't say the platform, but I'm a fan of one of those platforms you mentioned, uh, and I'll, I'm a convert like. Um, you know, my wife, Emily and I and others, Alex, we work mm -hmm. remotely, but we can be, we can be working the same visual board at the same time and see each other exactly. on there doing it. And that's just amazing. It, that's, it's even, so that, that's where I see the virtual huddles going to some platform like that. Yeah. Where, where, when the people are face to face, because they were, I was this company I was at, they had the face to face people were still on the computer and they were sitting, you know, across the room from each other. Yeah. It's like, no, we need to, you, you know, capitalize on the best of both worlds. So we need to have them face to face, but then bringing in the other ones through this board or something. So anyway, that's, it's still being built. So that's yeah. I know when COVID first hit, it was seen as a real fear and negative, but I think so much good has come out of it that, you know, like it's you said, advantage. we can, we can create organizations of problem solvers, have behavioral standards, operating excellent standards and, and achieve it remotely. Thanks to, in part, for the part that some technology companies have really done to make some amazing yeah. systems yeah. At, of recent times, I think. Yeah, you know, and, and just a parting thought on my end, you know, because because doing it manually, again, there's ownership, there's accountability, but man, there's time. And, and they always, the Japanese wanted this, again, to get the ownership and accountability to get to the problem solving. So they called the first three steps, you know, problem ID, and that's what should be happening, what's actually happening, do we have a gap? Now we can close the gap. So if we can use technology is my point to get the gap and trigger something, 
then we can spend on best in that time in the problem solving. Then we're, we're leveraging best of both worlds. Yeah, and we're moving forward. That's amazing. Hey, Mike, how, I know people can find your book on Amazon. I know, you know, or anywhere, you know, um, Toyota Culture, amazing book. And it helped me. I read it many, many years ago and I've read it twice since. But Mike, how can people reach out to you if they want to? How, how's the best way for them to get in touch with you if they want to learn more, get some coaching, get some help? Probably LinkedIn is the, probably the best way. I think that's how you and I connect. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's Mike Jose said LinkedIn is probably the best way. Yeah. But I'd be, I, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, well, Mike, thank you so much, Mike. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and you've helped me today. I've had many insights through our conversations and thank you for helping us create a better future with, um, in organisations as we go forward. Fantastic. Thanks, Bradley. Thanks again to you listeners. Thanks, Mike. What a great episode. Remember, you can go to our website, enterpriseexcellencepodcast.com backslash downloads to get hold of a diagram Mike will help me form, which outlines the link between an organization's behavioral and operating systems, root cause problem solving, innovation, and improvement. Please like, subscribe, and share this podcast to help others gain insights and create a better future. There were three key takeaways for me from this episode. One, cascading and helping teams at all levels form their operating and behavioral systems and competencies. Two, everyone as problem solvers, leaders as coaches. Three, all green no good, adjust to create more challenges. The first key takeaway, cascading the operating and behavioral system to enable the formation of a standard at all levels that teams own was amazing. Visualizing these two systems connected by root cause problem solving was a real insight for me. No standard, no problem. Creating this standard in an empowered, connected way at all levels of the organization creates the owned standard of culture and operating systems. This approach can be aligned similarly to an organization that is following a more agile, lean or Six Sigma approach, a financial, manufacturing, sales or service organization. It doesn't matter. The second key takeaway for me is everyone is a problem solver, leaders as coaches is about creating an organization of problem solvers who are being developed and improved themselves towards their potential always. What better way to form a learning organization of people who are growing and developing, improving and achieving great things always? Again, like mentioned, there is a standard for problem solving and coaching that can be supported and improved. The third key takeaway, all green, no good, is a great insight. Often in business, we chase the green, get there and then relax. The problem is that when we relax, we start getting red all over again. We spend our life bouncing up to that green level and away again. Mike's discussion around all green, no good highlights that when we achieve our meaningful, challenging or and aspirational goals, it is time for us to set new ones, creating new challenges and problems to improve and overcome towards that new goal. This is at the heart of creating a continuously improving culture. Thanks again for the great episode and all the insights, Mike. Thanks for helping us create a better future. Bye for now.